This is episode 29 of 10,000 Africans podcast. Welcome to 10,000 Africans podcast. This is your humble host, J.D. Tarpe. Today on the show, we have a TED fellow. If you don't know what that means, that means he has had a TED talk. He is an architect from Rwanda. His name is Christian Benimana, and he is working to build African design centers across the continent to meet the growing need for housing on the continent. And he's doing it in a unique way that we'll talk about today. So I'm incredibly happy to have Christian on the show today um, to talk about the future of homes and housing on the continent, essentially the future of building on the continent. Thank you so much for being on today, Christian. Uh, thank you for having me. Yes, so uh, it's. It, I explained your story a little bit, um, but it doesn't capture the full picture because there's more to you than, than that. So would you please fill in the gaps for us and tell us um, how your story, what is the story that has led you here? Uh, well, thanks, JD. Uh, again, uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, the story that led me here is uh, uh, is a... Is, is a uh, is a combination of, of, of uh, opportunities and uh, uh, chances. Uh, I, I started becoming uh, interested in architecture at early age, uh, and uh, following that, I kind of um, wanted to follow that as a dream, as something that I wanted to become. I wanted to push that as far as I can, and that drove me to apply for scholarships to study in China. Uh, at the time, there was no school of architecture in Rwanda, um, so when I got the opportunity to get that scholarship, um, it's naturally that I chose to study architecture since I wanted to be that. Um, China was an eye-opening for me. Uh, it taught me a lot. Uh, it, get, it broadened my perspective in great length. Um, uh, at the end of it, I think I had a better understanding of how my skills could contribute better uh, to, to the part of, of the, the, the continent where I was from. Uh, but also, in addition to that, I, I think there were lack of opportunities for career entry-level positions uh, in my field, in China particularly, a country that graduates a thousand and thousands of architects each year, as you may imagine. So I, uh, that's when I go back to Rwanda, and I think uh, uh, it would be a lie if I say I was prepared for um, the challenges that, that I, I, I found when I got back on the continent. Uh, and... I think I've, since that moment, uh, seven years ago or eight years ago, now we're in 2018, um, it, I think it became apparent to me that I'll have to make it a mission of, of my life to try to do something about it. Yes, sir. I like that. I think, man, I think you are, you're going the right way. So you came back uh, from China and you started with, with Mas. Um, and now you've started um, this African Design Center, which I am excited to talk about today. So what is African Design Center? Um, well, JD, I, I think for me to explain that better, I have to go back and uh, tell again another story of that, what started from uh, when I got back and, and ultimately what has led to the creation of the African Design Center. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that became apparent when I came back uh, from uh, studying in China is that uh, not only architecture was uh, still misunderstood, malpracticed, uh, but there was also like a problem of uh, capacity and, and, and passing the knowledge on. Um, uh, I think architecture stands in Africa stands uh, uh, lower, if not at the same position as any other profession, as, as you may imagine. Um, still in a chaotic uh, a kind of like state at the moment. But the, what made it worse is that uh, when the African continent growth started becoming a, a driving force in the development of the continent, uh, architecture happened to be at the intersection 
of um, intervention or development initiatives that had so much capital in it. Um, so because of that interface, it, it also found itself uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a crossfire of a lot of powerful influence that has forced it to become a very narrow uh, uh, field that serves the interests of uh, the powerful shapers of our societies in Africa. And, and you, can, you can name anyone you, or any organization or any uh, international company feel like uh, has that power to build, has that uh, privilege, we call it the privilege to build, the privilege to gather cap uh, enough capital to invest in a capital project. So uh, through our projects, we had also opportunities to work with um, partners who are willing to listen to us to try to disrupt that trend. Um, and when we built the Botaro Hospital, um, the impact that project had was uh, an eye-opening, both for us, but also for some partners who were willing to commit to that. Um, following Botaro Hospital and shaping our practice around uh, the, that philosophy that architecture can be deployed, architecture as a process can be deployed to impact positive systemic change in society. And then we took necessary steps to make sure that not only our, our practice as mass design group is built on that strong foundation, that we're able to keep consistency in each and every project we carry out. We, we understand what we set out to do as a mission and we set to achieve it. But also we, we have to figure out a way of scaling this um, both geographically, basically beyond the borders of Rwanda in beyond the reach of our own project and our own organization, but also like in time, like how, when do we, when we retire, how are these going to continue uh, down generations? So that's where the African Design Center Initiative started coming up as an idea of how do we craft a training program around this philosophy, this ethos that we've, designed, we've developed as a, uh, an architecture firm. The reason I'm so excited about African Design Center is that I believe that in my lifetime, Africa will, will get to a point of development. And I think we are going to and we are able to accelerate the growth and, and progress on the continent. And what you're doing is important to that because essentially you're saying, okay, we're going to decentralize um, design and architecture and, and replicate what we can do across the continent. Am I, am I right? Uh, that's correct, but not only doing it by ourselves, but also make sure like that knowledge is also decentralized, that actually other people can take it up and utilize it and deploy that same process. We deploy it to create uh, such an impact or even be able to build up on it and, and, and amplify that impact even further. Amazing, amazing, man. So talking about your TED Talk, I listened to that thing, man, I'm like, I, I'm clapping. <laughs> I, I, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Um, because it's so incredible. And you are speaking the truth. You're speaking about like something that it, it should be common sense, but it seemed not to be. Sim simple things like, and, and I've always talked about this, right? Simple things like building, the way we build, and we decide to, you know, copy models from everywhere and use materials that we always have to import. And, and the question is, why aren't we using local materials, right? So when you come in and say, you know what, we can do like massive projects uh, using local labor uh, and uh, uh, local resources and materials, I'm like, bravo. So what is possible with, with uh, using local materials and local labor? Yeah, uh, that's a, that's an interesting question, and I think um, most basically the way we 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 understood it is is more um, is more about uh, the like meeting the numbers. Um, like it's not the major concern. Uh, I think it's how we meet the numbers that makes sense. Uh, sorry, that 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 kind of. Uh, is the major concern here. I can give a short example. When we talk about uh, cities and, and, and shortages of housing um, 
in numbers, in terms of statistical data, um, we actually don't, we're not saying that all of those people we say don't have houses are sleeping outside. Um, as, a, as a society, we always find coping mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, but it's those coping mechanisms that bring these consequences to life and, and safety and security and dignity of people. So we believe that uh, our process, what it does is to uh, prioritize those other uh, important um, characters we want our society to have as a starting point. And then our architectural process is to develop solutions that only accepts those characteristics of society we want to achieve as the bare minimum and nothing less than that. And when you think it in that perspective, then you begin to question the costs of building um, all of those units using uh, any other current method we're using at the moment. You can analyze it, analyze it in, the, um, in the lens of uh, monetary costs, you can analyze it in lens of environmental costs. You can analyze it in um, uh, uh, the results on the social cohesion in our society that we create with the built environment that we built. Uh, when you do things, we do them now. And that's when you change things. It's not about... Uh, uh, it's not about the 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 end product, but it's what the end product achieves in terms of advancing the development of our society. Uh, and that's how we've been thinking about it all along is, is, is like our, our, our profession needs to, to be understood as not, uh, not, not a commodity that only produces products that are consumed by those who can only afford it. But, um, it, it's a, it's a, we are, our architects possess the power um, to be able to influence um, these processes that in the end will basically, of course, produce uh, physical infrastructure, but physical infrastructure that is an accurate representation of our underlying societal systems. So if I give an example, if you live in a city that um, is secluded, that is segregated, that is um, is is a um, uh, is a is a is, is consuming much more than than its its immediate surrounding can produce. Then obviously you're creating a beast that cannot be uh, fed or even sustained. Um, so that's the question I need to answer. Like, how can we deploy our abilities as designers? Or like, how can we use the existing uh, opportunities to create systems and solutions that can contribute to the sustenance of that particular society. I'm excited at what the possibilities are. Um, and so here's a, here's a quick question. Like, do you think it is, okay, so the background is, you know, we need 700 million houses, but we don't have 700 million days. So do you think it is it is possible for us to meet those demands in a sustainable fashion. Uh, yes, I'm very optimistic, as I said uh, in the TED talk that you're referencing to, and I, and I remain optimistic. I, I believe um, that we, we as people will always figure out solutions to our problems, uh, but it's how we, we, we the professionals, uh, so as we claim, uh, help the average population to use that knowledge we possess in a sustainable manner. Um, basically produce tools and, and systems, uh, produce um, uh, capacity within the, the communities uh, to be able to assist in that development. development. It, it's more like, think about it more like if you outsource, uh, not, not, you know, like open source, like you create an open source of knowledge. Yeah. But you make sure... There are also uh, measures to make uh, to 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 reinforce uh, the the uh, the right use of that knowledge. I think that's how we need to think about about this deployment. 
Because with such demand, you cannot expect all, even all the developers in the world combined and, and all the capital channel in Africa, that will still be impossible. So you need to be done on, on the community level. But it's how we articulate the values of those communities we are creating so that when people are feeding their contribution to that building boom, they can feed like within a framework that is at least not going to be uh, to collapse on its own weight or imbalances. Uh, that's that's the the main task at the moment. In a few in the fewest words are possible, uh, how would you summarize the value that your your work or you have added to the continent? Um, I would have quite we are, we are, we have provoked a conversation about the role of architecture, especially in resources limited settings. Um, we have articulated well enough that the achievement of our work is not measured by how much capital we invest in. Uh, but also that the end result uh, is n- should not be calibrated or capped to how much it should be infused, but it should be measured by uh, the achievement we want our work to achieve. After listening to your TED Talk, I went down a rabbit hole of <laughs> just watching different African um, African architects who are actually really having an impact on the continent. So, so yeah, you are sparking that conversation. Um, what is the what is the biggest for you? What is the biggest challenge that you have faced uh, so far working on the continent in 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 your business in architecture? Um, I think the the biggest the, the biggest challenge we, we face in in our field is um, is the the whole notion of how architecture is understood or or it's used. Um, I think. Uh, even worse from uh, fellow architects. Um, I think that counter, uh, uh, how do you call it, the like counter argument on, on why we should uh, just be, we should just limit our, our interventions to what we tasked to do. Of, of course, that comes from what we learned in school and see around people doing it as we, 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 we create buildings and we roll them out and, and that's our job and the rest belongs to politicians, economists, uh, sociologists, and, and all of these other other players. Um, instead, uh, instead of understanding our role as uh, like orchestra conductors, like we, we we kind of get all of that knowledge and that influence and try to orchestrate it in a way that when it's finally manifesting itself into the physical environment we occupy, it is actually it actually makes sense. Like that, that's our job. Uh, it, of course, it's complicated and frightening, and most people will not want to venture into that. Uh, but I believe that's, that's the main challenge we're facing at the moment um, from all angles of life that we have to deal with. Absolutely. That just drives right into, into our question because uh, being a change maker and going against the grain or the established norm is not at all an easy feat. And, you know, it takes a certain spark. It takes uh, something that, you know, that to keep you going. So what I want to know is, what is it that drives you to continue to do what you do? Um, that's an interesting question. I, uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, definitely what the way you just said, it's, there's a lot of uh, discouragement. And, and, um, but I when I, when I, when I, Every time I reflect on, on why do I have to keep fighting and, and keeping this fight up, I think it's not fear. I realize like I'm not afraid of the worst that can happen. But I'm, I'm very excited about how well uh, life could be if we do it right. I, I think to me that's the, the prize I keep my eyes on. Uh, I think that's what makes me wake up in the morning. I'm like, when we finally make it, like how good would that be? And that, that excites me much more than the worst that can happen. That is a beautiful um, driver. And I think, I think that is more important than actually looking at the, at the negative side of things. Working on the continent, you know, you, you've, you're doing important work there. You're spreading the message. Um, and you've been outside. You've been outside the continent. You've been in and you are going against the grain, and you are starting something new, something innovative. Um, 
what is that one advice that you give to to young Africans um, who are trying to do something similar, who or who are trying to build an organization or a business or do something out of the norm? Um, what would you what what advice would you give to them, whether they are in the diaspora or on the continent? Um, I think right now in Africa we need for young people we need we need people to committed and determined to do two things one is people who really want to work hard like um, uh, when I say work hard I'm not saying like just work long hours but make sure that uh, you understand the knowledge you understand what is done outside you you try to apply it into your own work if it doesn't work or if it falls apart uh, you pick yourself up and then do it again uh, and then the second one is we want people who want to do things well. Like if you're going to do it, like do it well. Like do not stop halfway through or don't do it to the minimum standard that you can achieve because it's easier. I think to for us, like we need to we need to raise the bar ourselves. Like we want people. Uh, like I don't care what you do. If you clean shoes, clean them better than anybody else on in the world. Like that's the type of standard I would encourage our youth. To be able to achieve and, and that is achieved through hard work to me that's the only advice that's amazing advice too because i think you know if you you can't do something half-heartedly you have to give exactly. it your all and you have it do it to do it to the best of your abilities and whether you like it or not whether you like it or not and that's the important part whether you like it or not yeah yeah um, like I, do, I do not want to lie to people to follow their passion none of these things and this is life sometimes it might not work but if you, I believe if you, you choose or you make a commitment to do that work, the minimum you can do is do it well. Christian, we are almost at the end um, here. Um, one final question before we go to our, uh, our rapid fire. Um, but before we actually do that, let me, let me ask, how can people find you? How can people connect with you? Um, how can people you know, tap into that knowledge or you're a public speaker as well. How can people uh, uh, book you and you know bring you out to stuff? Uh, well, I uh, my my schedule is is always full, so but uh, I'm always uh, keen. I'm always happy. I always want to talk to people and get connect with people. Uh, I, I respond to Twitter to tweets. Uh, my handle is at cbenimana. Um, uh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, Christian uh, underscore Benimana. Um, uh, my email address, I don't know if I can say it on your show, uh, but I welcome anybody sending me an email. It's Christian at mass group.org. Uh, I don't know if that, that is caught. Or Christian at African Design Center.org. Uh, both emails work. Awesome. I will, I'll also include it in the, in the link um, on the podcast. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Here's the final question. Um, if you had 10,000 Africans with, uh, at your disposal with expertise in every field, what would you do? Uh, if I had 10,000 Africans at my disposal in all fields of life, uh, I think I would, um, I would want to get a complete, basically have that team work together to complete an analysis and the magnitude of, of the problems you have and the impact they have on, uh, on, on each other, the, 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 the underlying um, the, the links between these problems. So, for instance, I can give an example. I can articulate uh, problems you have in Africa from an architectural lens. And I can put a number to the housing units that we will need based on my expertise. Um, I would love to have someone in finances uh, try to compute and tell us how much that is going to take and how, uh, let's say, through the, the, the current models of lending and, and, and borrowing uh, money from financial institutions would have an effect to that um, 35 years down the road. Um, what impact would that have on inflation? Um, and I would love so so sociologists to tell us about what will happen when we build brand new cities in less than 10 years uh, to house all this population. What will happen 
when cities like Lagos of 21 million people doubles or triples in population, I would want to understand what that means or looks like, or even uh, uh, how, 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 what strain of that put on our medical systems or the lack of, in that particular <laughs> context. Um, I would love to have a, a, a well-rounded perspective or view into uh, into something that can articulate um, the magnitude, uh, the urgency, and the the seriousness of the problems we're dealing with. Man, I share your vision. I see it. I can visualize it, um, and I I would I hope that with that some that we can we're able to do because it is very vital to to you know seeking out and finding out the problems and actually you know acting on them. Uh, man, thank right. you so much for for being on rapid fire question rapid fire question. What is your favorite book? My favorite book is uh, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. Nelson Mandela or Patrice Lumumba? Uh, Patrice Lumumba or Nelson Mandela. That's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll go with Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Why is that, though? Um, I believe that uh, uh, at times uh, you need to negotiate your way around even when you're right. Life is that complicated. So, uh, last but not least, outside of Rwanda, what is your favorite African country? Wow, that, uh, that's even a tougher one. <laughs> uh, uh, outside of Rwanda, what is my favorite African country? Um, and I might not be able to ask that question, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not sure that, that, that I have a, a straight answer to that question. I think my, my favorite African country is hypothetical. At the moment, okay, you know it's what? The I, one, it's the one that is yet to exist. Okay, okay, you know what? I'll, 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 I'll challenge you that. Hey, would you, would you explain a little bit what that is? What is, what is that hypothetical country like? That is yet to exist. Uh, I will be a country that that uh, manages to 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 move away from this state of. Uh, uh, and not knowing uh, how we're handling things that um, that doesn't have a, a, a re- I don't want to say like an African system of doing things because Africa is also diverse, but it's a localized, sophisticated systems that answers to the needs of that country's population in a real, true way. That does not compare it to the West or to the East, to China, to the US, to Europe, to whatever, but manages to create this identity. I believe in the power of identity. And I think all African countries that I know of the moment have a serious, serious identity problem. I can elaborate on that, but I think it's another podcast. <laughs> we have to get you back on. <laughs> yes, sir. I, man... Uh... You have no idea. I'm here shaking my head, um, uh, nodding my head because um, you are just, you know, saying things that is essentially my thoughts. Um, and I love it. I love it. So, man, Christian, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, I love that me as a guest. And I would, I'm guarantee. I'm telling you, please look up to it. I am going to invite you back on the show. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk more. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I share your vision and, you know, I'm in my own way going to, going to, to contribute to pushing that as well. And I hope that we have a lot more Africans who, um, who are doing, uh, their part to make that happen. So thank you so much for coming on Christian. I really appreciate you. Well, thanks JD for having me on the show. I'd, I'd be more than happy to come by because awesome. I also believe in what you're doing is equally important to, uh, to make sure that our voice is heard, that we reach out to other people, uh, like minds or skeptics, whoever want to listen and engage in our conversations. I would believe we will not be able to achieve our mission without having that first step of talking about it.
Thank you again for listening to another episode of 10,000 Africans Podcast. We look forward to hearing your feedback and your interactions. Uh, please send this podcast episode to a friend and another friend and families to make sure this platform continues to grow. Thank you very much again for listening. Have a wonderful week.